Okay, so this is my last day of uh, doing readings on the seven uh, factors of awakening. And I'll begin today's reading with uh, a reflection by, uh, by Ajahn Jeff, which is the last little talk or essay in his, in his book, Factors for Awakening. And uh, <coughs> it kind of uh, ties it all up. He's gone, he's gone through all of the, uh, <coughs> uh, the different uh, um, ways of, of, of practice. This one is titled Toward Release and it uh, was given April 9th, 2019. <coughs> Practicing mindfulness means keeping something in mind. Practicing right mindfulness means keeping in mind two activities that we'll be doing here as we meditate. <coughs> One is being with the breath. The Buddha calls this keeping track of the body in and of itself. In other words, you don't think about your body in the context of the world, how it looks to other people, how it looks to you, whether it's strong enough to do the work you want, uh, how much longer it's going to last. Just be with it as it is right now. Your sensation of the body right here. It's something <coughs> you know you've got right here. As Ajahn Fuyan says, said, if you can doubt the fact that you're breathing, then you can doubt everything. There would be nothing certain in the world at all. So focus on something that's sure. You've got the body here. You've got the breath coming in, the breath going out. That's one of the activities of right mindfulness, remembering to stay with the sensation of the breathing in and of itself. The other activity the Buddha calls putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. All your thoughts about what you want out of the world or your past disappointments with the world, put those aside. The problem is that we're very quick at picking them up again. <clears throat> Even though a lot of those issues are not right here, right now, we can easily create them into little worlds, and then we go into them. We're so good at that, creating worlds for our thoughts, worlds for our emotions, and then entering into them, losing our bearings here with the breath. So you have to take part not only no, so you have to take apart not only your greed and distress with reference to the world, but also any reference to the world at all. <clears throat> the Thai Ajans talk of, about this a lot with reference to a Pali term, term samati, although in Thai it's pr pr pronounced samut. It can be translated as convention or supposition. One of their examples of a convention is paper money. It's just paper, but we give it much more value than just paper. We agree that it's worth $1, $10, $100, and so on. And because the agreement carries on through time, and because enough people agree to it, it's more than just children playing make-believe. We can actually get some value out of the paper. So these suppositions have their purposes. They, ser they serve their functions. But outside of those functions, they still are make-believe, and they can be a burden. You don't want to carry them into areas where they're not appropriate, as when you're carrying a lot of paper money in a sack over your back as you walk into a dangerous neighborhood at night. In the same way, right now as you're meditating, any supposition that has anything at all to do with the world is a burden on the concentration. It's not appropriate here. People complain about how, how hard it is to practice nowadays. Part of it's because we're invaded by the suppositions of the world all the time. Or we open ourselves to their invasions. We carry little screens around with us. We're constantly in contact with other people who have those suppositions. To be in conversation with them, we have to pick up their suppositions and agree to them. But when you're coming here to be alone with your breath, you want to divest yourself of them. 
for the time being, think of the world outside simply as an idea. And that's what it is in your mind right now, just an idea. You have no other direct experience of it. Memories of the past are things you're churning up from inside. Plans for the future, you're churning up from inside. You could even take <coughs> your sense of here and how you're sitting here, where's east, where's west, where's north, south, and try to erase those directions. Think about the fact that your mind is simply present but not oriented in any direction. We tend to think of the mind as facing forward because the eyes are in the front of the body and the information from the eyes takes up so much of our awareness. But now that our eyes are closed, we don't need to think about which direction is forward, which direction is back, up or down. As the Buddha said, you want to make forward and back, up and down, all equal so that there's just awareness. That's just one of the conventions of the world that we brought in. Put aside as many of these conventions as you can. See them as suppositions, things you've supposed into being. And then watch for the mind that wants to go out and get involved in those worlds again. Ask it, where are you going? And why are you going? The more thoroughly you can put away these ideas, the easier it will be to stay with the breath in and of itself and to develop your sensitivity for what's actually going on right here in body and mind. Instead of wanting to know so much about out there, ask yourself something simple about in here. The Buddha starts his instructions for breath meditation with something very, very simple. He says, discern long breathing, discern short breathing. It's interesting that in his 16 steps for breath meditation, he uses the verb to discern only in the very first two steps. Discerning long breathing, discerning short breathing. How are you going to know if a breath is long or short? You have to make comparisons. If this, is this breath longer than the last one, or is it shorter? That requires that you be mindful to remember the last breath, and that you can compare it with this one. It's not that you can put two breaths side by side, the last breath is gone while you're with this breath, and yet you're able to compare it. <clears throat> what are the functions of the mind that allow you to do that? Mindfulness and discernment. Mindfulness to remember, discernment to pass judgment. And you are passing judgment. So you're not exclusively in the present. You do want to get anchored in something that's right here, something that you don't have to suppose into being. But at the same time, you have to, have to exercise some mental functions that can en encompass the past, and you want to get good at that. You want to get good at keeping something in mind that's relevant to what you want to do now, and you have to want to develop the ability to make comparisons. You read so much about what's wrong with the judging mind or the comparing mind, but the only place I've ever seen the Buddha counsel against the judging mind is when he says, don't try to judge other people's attainments. You can never really know for sure what someone else's attainment is. But you do want to pass judgment on which people are good to hang around with, which people are not, and in your own mind, which mental states are good to hang around with, and which ones are not. And you want to learn how to reliably judge these things for yourself. That requires powers of observation and the ability to ask the right questions, because that's a lot of what discernment is. So we start developing those powers and functions of the mind in the right direction by focusing them on something direct and immediate, the process of breathing. When the Buddha talks about the factors for awakening, there are two processes or two exercises that he says are really helpful. One is develop, to develop appropriate attention the ability to ask the right questions. The other is to practice breath meditation. And it's not as if these were two things to be done separately. You do them together. You focus on the breath, applying the right questions to the breath and to your mind's relationship to the breath. We are here looking at three things basically. The breath, the feelings that come up with the breath 
and then the mind state that watches and that is soothed by the breath. The mind is both on the receiving end and on the proactive end in its relationship to the breath. On the receiving end, it's alert to the level of comfort coming from the breath and its effect on the mind. On the proactive end, it tries to figure out which kind of breathing is more comfortable, long or short, because that's what appropriate attention does. It asks you which kinds of things are having a good effect and which kinds of things are having a bad effect. Then you extend that questioning further. When the breath feels comfortable and gives rise to a sense of well-being, even a sense of rapture, what do you do with it? Well, you spread it around. You expand your awareness and try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. You let the feeling of well-being and rapture spread to fill both the body and your awareness. Then you ask yourself, what kind of impact is the breath having on the body? What kind of impact is the breath having on the mind? If the mind needs to be gladdened, you're happy to breathe in a way that gives energy. If the mind needs to be steadied, you breathe in a way that's more calming. Now, even though the Buddha mentions the word discern only in the first two steps of breath meditation, that doesn't mean that you don't use discernment in the remaining steps. It's just that the word goes into the background and the actual issues of discernment come to the foreground. For instance, in the fourth step, the Buddha tells you to calm bodily fabrication, that is, <coughs> the in and out breathing. In step seven and eight, he tells you to breathe sensitive to mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions, and then to calm mental fabrication. Now, seeing things in terms of fabrication is one of the basic principles of insight and discernment. Getting sensitive to how the actions of the breath fabricate your sense of the body and how the actions of feelings and perceptions fabricate your state of mind. But the Buddha doesn't leave you with just being sensitive. In telling you to calm these things, he's telling you to make the best use of this sensitivity, to combine insight with tranquility, to calm the body, you calm the breath, to gladden the mind, you focus on feelings and perceptions that give you energy. To steady the mind to get it concentrated, you focus on more calming feelings and perceptions, such as the labels you apply to the body or the breath. As you do this, you get more and more sensitive to the fact that you are doing things here in the present moment to create this experience. True, you're not creating it out of whole cloth, but you are fabricating your sense of the present out of the raw material provided by your past kamma. This applies to all of your present experiences, whether you're meditating or not. The desire to fabricate your present experience <coughs> well and the question you ask as a result of the desire to do it well. Those qualities take you beyond simply being with the breath and turn into right view and appropriate attention. Then, once the mind feels soothed by the breath and the feelings of ease associated with the breath, it will settle down. The breath itself then, as the mind settles down, gets more and more steady, more and more calm. It can even get to the point where it stops, because your brain is using so little oxygen and the breath energies in, in the body are so well connected that you don't need to breathe. Now, you're not forcing the breath to stop. It's just that you feel no need for it. The mind is that calm. And then the next question is, what do you do with that calm? What do you do with the concentration and equanimity that go along with it? The Buddha talks about developing the factors for awakening even further. He says that based on seclusion, by which he means the mind secluded in concentration, you try to develop dispassion. You do that by looking <coughs> at how inconstant the things are that you tend to latch onto in the body, feelings and mind, and in the world at large. 
They come, they go, they leave us, they leave us. And so much of our interest in them is very, very constructive. In other words, a little something happens out in the world and we have to embroider it to make it satisfying enough, interesting enough to feed the mind. But when you see the extent to which you have to put so much effort into getting satisfaction out of things that are just going to keep leaving you, you begin to wonder, well, why did I go for that? What's the allure? <coughs> when you can start taking <coughs> apart some of the some of the suppositions or conventions that you use to create a sense of interest in the world or to function in the world, you can get down to where the real allure for these things is. What gratification you're getting out of them. <coughs> and when you begin to see that the allure isn't worth it when it's compared with the drawbacks, that's when you develop this passion. Your interest in all these things that you fabricate begins to cease. As a result, the fabrications themselves begin to cease, because the desire that kept them going is no longer there. Part of the mind keeps analyzing what's going on, but it's a very subtle kind of analysis on top of what you've, you've done here. The mind eventually lets go, and it lets go of everything, even those most basic conventions and suppositions at that point even the conventions of the path itself. After all, even right view is a convention. It's based on the desire for true happiness, and it has its assumptions and suppositions, which have their value in leading to true happiness. But once that happiness is found, you can let it go too. In fact, you have to. Otherwise, the mind wouldn't be totally released. Once the letting go is total, the release, the freedom that's revealed, is total as well. Now this is something that can be done. It's not just a story that comes from ancient India. We read the stories about people gaining awakening, listening to the Buddha, and we wonder, why was it so easy for them and so hard for us? That's hard to say. We'd have to go back and interview them. But we do have the teachings of the four Sajans and the people who practice with them. They say it can still be done. It may be harder now, may require more work because there are more suppositions to undo, undo. It's really hard to say, but a lot of it has to do with our willingness to put our suppositions aside, to step back from even the most basic, basic things we assume about ourselves and about the world, and to ask ourselves, what would the mind be like if we could just drop these assumptions for the time being? We're not denying that they have their validity, their time and place, but when you bring them into the mind in areas where they're not relevant, you create a lot of unnecessary trouble for yourself. So right now the issues of the world are not relevant. See how much you can put them aside, let them go and focus on what needs to be done to get the mind to settle down, to develop these qualities of concentration and discernment in dialogue with each other. After all, that's what it comes down to. In the factors for awakening, you've got discernment first and it leads to concentration. In the five faculties, concentration leads to discernment. They're in dialogue. And the and the dialogue is about appropriate attention. Where is the suffering right now? What am I doing to cause it? What qualities of mind can I develop to help abandon the cause so that I can calm the mind and realize what the noble people of the past have realized? That, that the news of awakening, the news of release, doesn't ju just have to be their news, it can be my news too. You have to remember that putting aside suppositions is not something that happens just at the end of the path. When you're asking the questions of appropriate attention, you're looking at everything in terms of cause and effect, action and result. A lot of the constructs of the world that we build around our actions and our identities and our thoughts about the world get in the way of directly seeing our actions and their results. So get your discernment in dialogue with your concentration to strip these things away 
And you'll find that instead of becoming poor as you let things go, you'll, you're actually a whole lot richer. <coughs> okay, this next um, uh, reading will be a sutta from, from the uh, Bojanga Sanyutta, Sanyutta 46, this is Sutta number 30, Udai. Uh, Udai is recounting his practice to the Buddha. On one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sumbhas, where there was a town of the Sumbhas named Sedaka. Then the Venerable Udai approached the Blessed One and said to him, It is wonderful, Venerable Sir, it is amazing, Venerable Sir. How helpful has been my devotion and reverence for the Blessed One, my sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing. For in the past, Venerable Sir, when I was still a householder, I did not have much concern for the Dhamma or the Sangha. But when I considered my devotion and reverence for the Blessed One and my sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing, I went forth from the household life into homelessness. The Blessed One taught me the Dhamma thus, such is form, such is origin, such is passing away, such is feeling, such is perception, such are volitional formations, such is consciousness, such is origin, such is passing away. Then, Venerable Sir, when, while I was staying in an empty hut following along with the surge and decline of the five aggregates subject to clinging, I directly knew as it really is, this is suffering. I directly knew as it really is, this is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it really is, this is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it really is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I have made the breakthrough to the Dhamma, Venerable Sir, and have obtained the path, which, when I have developed and cultivated, will lead me on. While I am dwelling in the, in an, in the appropriate way, to such a state that I shall understand, destroyed as birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more for this state of being. I have obtained the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which, when I have developed and cultivated, will lead me on, while I am dwelling in the appropriate way, to such a state that I shall understand, destroyed as birth, uh, so on, there's no more for this state of being. I have developed the enlightenment factor uh, of uh, investigation of states, of, uh, of energy, of joy, of tranquility, uh, of concentration. I have obtained the enlightenment factor of equanimity, which, when I have developed and cultivated it, will lead me on, while I am developing in the appropriate way to such a state that I shall understand, destroy this birth, there is no more state of the, for this state of being. This Venerable Sir is the path that I have obtained, which will lead me on um, to such a state that I shall understand, destroy this birth, there is no more state, no more for this state of being. Good, good Udai, indeed Udai, this is the path that you have obtained, and when you have developed and cultivated it, it will lead you on while you are dwelling in the appropriate way, to such a state that you will understand, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So that, uh, <coughs> the encouragement the Buddha is giving. Comment on that? Yeah. Um, uh, is the Ule a stream enter at that point? At that point, he'd be a stream enter. But yeah, he's not definitely he's fired up. Okay, next sutta, send you to forty-six, number fifty-three, fire. Um, this is kind of classic instructions on the application of these factors and it's always relevant to 
remember and reflect on. Then in the morning a number of bhikkhus dressed and taken their bowls and robes entered Savati for alms. Um, and they probably had some conversation with uh, 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 bhikkhus from our uh, wanderers from other other sects and uh, talking about the uh, practice, the training, and then the and the bhikkhu continue, uh, uh, the Buddha continues, bhikkhus, when wanderers of other sects speak thus, they should be asked, friends, when the mind becomes sluggish, which factors of enlightenment is it, is it untimely to develop on that occasion, and which factors of enlightenment is it timely to develop on that occasion? Then, friends, when the mind becomes excited, which factors of enlightenment is it untimely to develop on that occasion, and which factors of enlightenment is it timely to develop on that occasion? Being asked thus, those wanderers would not be able to reply, and further they would meet with vexation. For what reason? Because they would not be within their domain. I do not see anyone because in this world with its devas, mara and brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans who could satisfy the mind with an answer to these questions except the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata or one who has heard it from them. On an occasion, bhikkhus, when the mind becomes sluggish, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factor of tranquility, the enlightenment factor of concentration, and the enlightenment factor of equanimity. For what reason? Because the mind is sluggish, bhikkhus, and it is difficult to arouse it with those things. Suppose, bhikkhus, a man wants to make a small fire flare up. If he throws wet grass, wet cow dung, and wet timber into it, sprays it with water, and scatters soil over it, would he be able to make that small fire flare up? No, venerable sir. So too, because on an occasion when the mind becomes sluggish, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factor of tranquility, the enlightenment factor of concentration, and the enlightenment factor of equanimity. For what reason? Because the mind is sluggish, because, and it is difficult to arouse it with those things. On an occasion, because when the mind becomes sluggish, it is timely to develop the enlightenment factor of discrimination of states, the enlightenment factor of energy, and the enlightenment factor of rapture. For what reason? Because the mind is sluggish, bhikkhus, and it is easy to arouse it with those things. Suppose, bhikkhus, a man wants to make a small fire flare up. If he throws dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry timber into it, blows on it and does not scatter soil over it, would he be able to make that small fire flare up? Yes, Venerable Sir. So too, Bhikkhus, on an occasion when the mind becomes sluggish, it is timely to develop the enlightenment factor of discrimination of states, the enlightenment factor of energy, and the enlightenment factor of rapture. For what reason? Because the mind is sluggish, Bhikkhus, and it is easy to arouse it with those things. On an occasion, Bhikkhus, when the mind becomes excited, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factor of discrimination of states, the enlightenment factor of energy, and the enlightenment factor of rapture. For what reason? Because the mind is excited, Bhikkhus, and it is, it is difficult to calm it down with those things. <coughs> Suppose, bhikkhus, a man wants to extinguish a great bonfire. If he throws dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry timber into it, blows on it, and does not scatter soil over it, would he be able to extinguish that great bonfire? No, venerable sir. So too, bhikkhus, on an occasion, when the mind becomes excited, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factor of discrimination of states the enlightenment factor of energy and the enlightenment factor of rapture. For what reason? Because the mind is excited, because, and it is difficult to calm it down with those things. On an occasion, because, when the mind becomes excited, 
It is timely to develop the enlightenment factor of tranquility, the enlightenment factor of concentration, and the enlightenment factor of equanimity. For what reason? Because the mind is excited, because, and it is easy to calm it down with those things. Suppose, because, a man wants to exti extinguish a great bonfire. If he throws wet grass, wet cow dung, and wet timber into it, sprays it with water, and scatters soil over it, would he be able to extinguish that great bonfire? Yes, Venerable Sir. So too, Vickers, on an occasion when the mind becomes excited, it is timely to develop the enlightenment factor of tranquility, the enlightenment factor of concentration, and the enlightenment factor of equanimity. For what reason? Because the mind is excited, Vickers, and it is easy to calm it down with those things. But mindfulness, Vickers, I say, is always useful. Way in that sutta. Um, any questions, comments on that one? Yeah, it seems wisdom is not explicitly in the list, but it's implicitly there. Uh, discriminate the investigation of states or in the like Dhamma Vichaya. Yeah, in that. Well, that. the wisdom in that, like, my mind's excited right now. Yeah, yeah, well, it's mindfulness as well. Uh, yeah. uh, do you have any advice on how to generate energy using Dhamma Vijaya? Well, I mean, just uh, actually, you, you know, picking up an object, like consciously picking up an object of reflection, uh, say, okay, just as an example. What the heck did Ajahn Pasano talk about last night? <laughs> Wasn't it? It was six things. How many? <laughs> one, two, one, two. <laughs> what else did he say? <laughs> you know, so it's just like investigation and, and, and contemplation and then, and then trying to remind oneself. It's like ap applying the mind to an investigation. Reading the teachings or listening to Dhamma talks be in the Dhamma Pardon? Can reading reading sutras or listening to Dhamma talks be considered in the name of Dhamma Vichaya? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's uh, I mean that's how I came across that sutra is from listening to. Cause I've got uh, I'm good on my on my phone. <laughs> Uh, listening and, and uh, come across these gems. So I'm looking to reading as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, last reading that I will do is uh, from Anguttara Nikaya, Anguttara 10, number 61. On ignorance, so that's uh, these are conditioning influences and in how to um, how to nourish the path. <coughs> because this is said, a first point of ignorance, because is not seen such that before this there was no ignorance, and afterward it came into being. Still, ignorance is seen to have a specific condition. I say because that ignorance has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for ignorance? It should be said, the five hindrances. The five hindrances too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the five hindrances? It should be said, the three kinds of misconduct. The three kinds of misconduct, too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the three kinds of misconduct? It should be said, non-restraint of the sense faculties. Non-restraint of the sense faculties, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for non-restraint of the sense faculties? It should be said, lack of mindfulness and clear comprehension. 
Lack of mindfulness and clear comprehension, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is nutriment for the lack of mindfulness and clear comprehension? It should be said, careless attention. Careless attention, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for careless attention? It should be said, lack of faith. Lack of faith, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for lack of faith? It should be said, not hearing the good Dhamma. Not hearing the good Dhamma, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for not hearing the good Dhamma? It should be said, not associating with good persons. Thus, not associating with good persons, becoming full, fills up not hearing the good Dhamma. Not hearing the good Dhamma, becoming full, fills up the lack of faith. Lack of faith, becoming full, fills up careless attention. Careless attention, becoming full, fills up lack of mindfulness and clear comprehension. Lack of mindfulness and clear comprehension becoming full fills up non-restraint of the sense faculties. Non-restraint of the sense faculties becoming full fills up the three kinds of misconduct. The three kinds of misconduct becoming full fill up the five hindrances. The five hindrances becoming full fill up ignorance. Thus there is nutriment for ignorance and in this way it becomes full. Just as when it is raining and the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the water flows down along the slope and fills the clefts, gullies and creeks. These becoming full fill up the pools. These becoming full fill up the lakes. These becoming full fill up the streams. These becoming full fill up the rivers. And these becoming full fill up the great ocean. Thus there is nutriment for the great ocean and in this way it becomes full. So too, not associating with good persons, becoming full, fills up not hearing the good Dhamma, and so on through that sequence, back to, or up to, and the five hindrances becoming full, fill up ignorance. Thus there is nutriment for ignorance, and, this way, and in this way it becomes full. I say, because that true knowledge and liberation have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for true knowledge and liberation? It should be said, the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the seven factors of enlightenment? It should be said, the four establishments of mindfulness. The four establishments of mindfulness, too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the four establishments of mindfulness? It should be said, the three kinds of good conduct. The three kinds of good conduct, too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for the, the three kinds of good conduct? It should be said, restraint of the sense faculties. Restraint of the sense faculties, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for restraint of the sense faculties? It should be said, mindfulness and clear comprehension. Mindfulness and clear comprehension, too, I say, have a nutriment. They are not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for mindfulness and clear comprehension? It should be said, careful attention. Careful attention, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for careful attention? It should be said, faith. Faith, too, I say, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for faith? It should be said, hearing the good Dhamma. Hearing the good Dhamma, too, has a nutriment. It is not without nutriment. And what is the nutriment for hearing the good Dhamma? It should be said, associating with good persons. Thus, associating with good persons becoming full fills up hearing the good Dhamma. Hearing the good Dhamma becoming full fills up faith. Faith becoming full fills up careful attention. Careful attention becoming full 
fills up mindfulness and clear comprehension. Mindfulness and clear comprehension becoming full fill up restraint of the sense faculties. Restraint of the sense faculties becoming full fills up the three kinds of good conduct. The three kinds of good conduct becoming full fill up the four, founda- four establishments of mindfulness. The four establishments of mindfulness becoming full fill up the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment becoming full fill up true knowledge and liberation. Thus there is nutriment for true knowledge and liberation, and in this way they become full. Just as when it is raining, and the rain pours down in thick droplets on the mountain top, the water flows down along the slope and fills the clefts, gullies, and creeks. These becoming full fill up the pools. These becoming full fill up the lakes. These becoming full fill up the streams. These becoming full fill up the rivers. And these becoming full fill up the great ocean. Thus there is a nutriment for the great ocean. And in this way it becomes full. So too, associating with good persons becoming full fills up hearing the good Dhamma. Uh, through to uh, the whole sequence, uh, up to the seven factors of enlightenment, becoming full, fill up true knowledge and liberation. Thus there is nutriment for true knowledge and liberation, and in this way they become full. great teaching to remind us of how 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 it's nourished and nurtured Uh, it isn't just sort of accomplished through an act of will or or wishful thinking or even bashing away at one thing uh, even diligently a body, speech, and mind. 